Doom Eternal is a real cookout flex. Since its release two years ago, I think it's safe to say that it stood out as a monolith of the FPS genre. It brought with it a burgeoning wave of seemingly, but not quite, classic first-person shooter games. Coming off Doom 2016, they could have just coasted along on the solid gameplay formula they had established, but instead, they went all out. They completely shook up the formula, making a shooter quite unlike anything before but with vital lessons from the past 25 years of the first-person shooter genre. It certainly echoed many features from the past. Doom Eternal had vision. That is eminently clear. It's already been two years. The dust has settled, so now I'm going to review the game. I'm reviewing not just the game alone, but in context. I'm reviewing it with all the DLC updates, and I'm reviewing its influence over the past two years. But before that, like every 30-year-old boomer who's made a video on this game, the montage. I'm going to go back in time a bit, or a lot. The classic Doom games were, naturally, icons. They were the combination of good design and great technology. Everybody has summarized the influence of the classic games. John Carmack and Romero and everybody else were among the very best, yada yada yada. But id Software atrophied pretty quickly by modern standards. Not exactly helped by a vitriolic development environment that rewarded backstabbing. By the time of Half-Life, people were looking for more methodical shooters. With more story, more thought, id floundered for the next 15 years or so with Quake 4, Doom 3 and Rage. The departure of John Carmack in 2013 was emblematic of the complete annihilation of the old id. But something new was born in the ashes. Hugo Martin joined the year that Carmack left, and he would go on to be one of the key influences on what was to come next. Doom 4 was in development hell from around 2007. It was a project without vision, with a clear lack of creativity. It was a highly scripted Call of Duty clone about Earth being invaded and you fight back with a team of ragtag resistance. It looked completely garbage. It even had this generic cinematic glory killing quick time event. Wonder if that shows up again. They refocused the game and turned that terrible old game into a complete reboot of the Doom series, with a focus on the speed. Cover was deliberately ineffective, pushing you to dodge projectiles. You carry your entire arsenal on you like classic shooters, and there's no reloading. Oh, and they brought back those melee kills, made them quicker, and they became glory kills, which were essential to what they referred to as push forward combat. You got your health and ammo back only by directly engaging enemies. Doom 2016 was a surprise hit. It looked kinda bad before launch. And basically everyone was surprised when the game came out, and it was actually good. In all honesty, it was a brand new, nascent style of game, with features that were reminiscent of classic shooters. But it had a distinct and brand new vision. It gained an audience, and naturally, a sequel was inevitable. People expected the sequel to be a bigger, better, badder sequel that built upon the foundation of 2016. Instead, what we got was a complete evolution of it. Something that used 2016 as a launch pad to go into a completely new direction. Uncharted territory. There are a number of terms the developers have used when talking about the design of this game that you'll keep hearing repeated. Terms such as the fun zone and the aforementioned push forward combat. To summarize, as best I understand, Doom is concerned primarily with player engagement. It hopes to achieve this by making a fast game, one which constantly bombards you with stimuli that you have to respond to, one that keeps you moving pushing forward. It is their firm belief, design-wise, that some ways of playing a game are better than others. They want you switching weapons constantly, finding new objectives around the map to do constantly, getting health, ammo, and armor, changing to the right weapon for the right job, and it wants you to multitask, having all these options available to you at once. Doom Eternal requires a lot of thinking. Now, contrary to popular belief, Doom Eternal doesn't force you into playing its way. It just really, 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 really strongly implies that you should be playing a certain way. This is because they find that players tend to get more engaged when they're pushed 
to play a certain way. Most people, when given the freedom, will opt to take the easiest path, the path of least resistance, the path that will ruin their own fun. The Doom Eternal E3 demo was played in a very specific way, one which made it look and ultimately feel more entertaining. Hugo Mann, the designer, felt that the AI at the time wasn't really pushing people into playing that way. So the enemies were beefed up, being more aggressive and tanking more shots being a harder counter to the Slayer and all of his abilities. The enemies push right into your face and hit hard. They're very agile, making 2016's enemies seem like they belong on my 600 pound life. You also have far more limited ammunition. You need to keep chainsawing to get ammo back. It's actually quite fair as well, even on Nightmare. You can take a few hits before dying and most of the time, your deaths do feel preventable. There is a massive enemy roster for you to face off against, and which keeps the game from feeling stale. They've brought back basically every enemy from Classic Doom, plus a fuck ton more. Virtually every battle takes place in a closed off arena. This, combined with the bright colors, certainly makes it feel very gamey. But, so long as the game itself is fun, most people will forgive something like that. They also went hard with the infamous Marauder, who is a hard counter in the truest sense. He is incredibly fast and will punish every mistake you make. It's like he huffed a mixture of Ritalin, cocaine and G Fuel before going to fight you. You need good timing to be able to beat him and, for most people, he is a monumental challenge to surpass the first time around. The Marauder's infamy has only increased over the years, but I'm not sure the reputation is entirely earned. Although I won't lie, I got absolutely destroyed by the Marauder the first time I faced him. Like I was a feminist and he was a teenager with a crossed arm cartoon fairy avatar. You have to keep using your abilities, which I think is something fairly unique to Doom Eternal, at least as far as shooters go. It almost feels like an RTS with the micromanaging you have to do. Doom Eternal has this reputation as the ultimate classic shooter and is seen as the vanguard of the boomer shooter movement. Doom Eternal, despite its reputation, takes just about as much, if not more, from the past 20 years of shooters as it does Doom. The abilities are one of the ways that Doom Eternal completely breaks from its classic 90s origins. One of the standards then was to have every weapon in a separate slot Melee, grenades, weapons, equipment, all separate weapon slots you have to switch to. Doom Eternal's instant access abilities is more like the golden triangle concept from Halo of having melee, guns, grenades, equipment, etc. all mapped to a unique button and available all at once. It bet very strongly on this new direction because they could have just rested on their laurels. Doom 2016 2020 edition probably would have sold very well, but Hugo and the team knew what they liked and what the game was meant to be. It paid off. I don't think it's unfair to say that Doom Eternal is prolific. It has gained an intense audience who will view everything and anything through the lens of Doom Eternal. Man, I was watching this NASCAR race and they were driving so fast it was like Doom Eternal out there. And last night I went to this concert and the drummer was playing so fast and all intricate, I got major Doom Eternal vibes, bro. Oh, and I bought these cool shoes last week. You gotta put the laces through these hooks at the top to make them fit right. You can't just ignore that shit, you know? It's a lot like how Doom Eternal wants you to master its systems to find okay, success. Okay, okay, I get it. I understand, don't worry. Are you sure? I could go on much more about this. No, no, that's fine. Thank you, Under the Mayor. Anyway, back to the video. Not to mention the obsessive overuse of that one song in particular in literally any context. It's pretty hard to not have heard this before. The Slayer gained a reputation as the ultimate badass. This is more of a new thing. I mean, id considered Doom to be survival horror, at least as evidenced by Doom 3. I mean, personally, I think this Doom Guy ultimate badass thing came about after Doom Guy lost to Master Chief in the death battle. But hey, what can you do? <laughs> Okay, that is complete bullshit. They still haven't recovered. Doom Eternal was something of a phenomenon, and people still talk about it to this day. The fact that people still discuss and play and practice and optimize this purely single player game after two years is incredible. 
And yes, I said purely single player. Battle mode kinda sucks. I do absolutely commend the fact that they've been putting effort into constant updates for it, giving it progression and everything, but people are here for the single player, which is kind of disappointing. I'm one of those people who actually enjoyed Doom 2016's multiplayer. It was actually good. Being made by Certain Affinity, led by Max Hoberman, the designer for Halo 2's multiplayer. They could have built upon it and cut some of the bullshit like loadouts. I hope id makes another multiplayer first person shooter. Although I'm not sure if their new masters want them to be eating into Halo's market. The music is naturally pretty incredible as well. The only thing they fear is you is now a famous track. It's so closely tied with the identity of Doom. It's centered around this central repeating earworm riff. It's actually very simple, but it's obviously done its job incredibly well if it's managed to resonate with so many people, becoming the de facto anthem for energy and rage. It's certainly metal, but not so much like the classic Doom, which is very much of the 90s, Metallica, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden type stuff. It's not really modern metal either, where you'd typically expect monstrous guitar wank at a million notes per second. It's honestly just as much dubstep as it is metal, which is impressive, rescuing dubstep from the jaws of epic no-scope compilations and associated cringe. There's also a lot of variation in the official soundtrack that goes unrecognized, which I don't think is fair. There are tracks that evoke a far more alien feeling, that use the synth in a completely different way. I think the switch to Andrew Holschult for the DLCs was a step down. Don't get me wrong, he's certainly still great. The soundtrack is still good, but Mick Gordon created some proper earworms, standout tracks that were just as good outside of the context of the game as in the game. Musical icons. There are some parallels between the situation with Mick Gordon and with Marty O'Donnell and Bungie, although the situations certainly weren't identical by any means. I think it's from a fundamental discrepancy between the world of music and the world of video games, at least AAA games. Something to do with production just not gelling with the artistry of music. In both cases, the musician complained about studio interference in their work, and the studio complained about the musician not meeting quotas. Although at least Mick Gordon was properly credited for music that he wrote. I can understand that this is a challenge that games naturally face, being an amalgamation of virtually every art form, visuals, music, and design. I think it's clearly one the industry still needs to solve. Speaking of the visuals, they're stellar as well, and something I think retained consistent quality across all the DLCs. Basically every level was a brand new environment, it felt like they just handed the artists the reins, and like good old cowboys, they went hog wild. The skyboxes are often stunning with a real sense of scale and the environments are incredibly detailed. There's a ton of variation as well, each environment is different from the last. From a well-rendered Earth City, to some ancient fantasy city, to a Hell City. Okay, it's very much within the urban planning realm, but there's also some Geiger-esque Bizarro Heaven realm as well. In the DLC, you've got places like a giant spear, a world spear even, or an offshore rig. I will admit though, these fantasy levels kind of gave me Unreal Store asset vibes. Obviously, they're a lot higher quality than what you'd typically find on the store, but it's just the placement of these oversized fantasy wheelbarrows that they just feel out of place. I also think it's downright impressive how well this runs, with the texture quality in these massive environments. Games like, oh, I don't know, Halo Infinite sure could learn a lot from this. The id tech engine is very well optimized. Although I was a bit salty it couldn't run on my previous GPU, even on low. I understand why completely. It just felt like a really shit time to have my generation of card phased out, like I got shafted. Uh, it's really nothing to do with Doom though, just my rants about the GPU market whenever the issue of PC performance comes up. There's one issue I do have with the visuals though, and this is an issue that extends to the story, the level design, and the world building. The visuals are really just set dressing. It's a ghost train. You never interact with the environment in any meaningful way. Traversing from place to place in the Doom campaign feels like window shopping or a padded indoor play center with the actual level layouts being largely the same. This 90s style multiplayer arena with each end locked off. 
And I know a lot of people defend it saying it's an arena shooter, but first of all, that term has always referred to multiplayer games. Even Classic Doom didn't have this kind of level design. And all of these 90s style arenas are strung together in a linear fashion. There are invisible walls absolutely everywhere. So many areas just feel arbitrarily cordoned off. Like in the Ancient Gods 2, this massive Marvel battle. It's meant to feel huge, but then you go into the fight completely alone, just like every other fight. You never fight alongside these Night Sentinel dudes. That's a lost opportunity. The dynamic of leading a squad of NPCs would fit right into the power fantasy of being the leader of the fighting forces of humanity. It feels like there's no sense of discovery in this game. Everything is prescribed to you. It tells you about virtually every mechanic in detail. And it doesn't tell you smartly through the level design either. Well, at least sometimes it does early on. But for the most part, it resorts to these tutorial messages with a video. Or it randomly teleports you to some alternate training sim universe. It doesn't let you discover things like quick switching on your own. At least after the updates over the years. After all those updates, it did become increasingly clear what their agenda was. I mean, they literally ended up giving the Marauder this cartoon swirly head thing to know exactly how long he's stunned for. You can't just figure out his stun period on your own through, I don't know, experience. No, it must be spelled out. You never formulate your own playstyle. Yes, I understand why they did it. They believed that a certain playstyle was more fun, having to use all your abilities. And I did, admittedly, find it fun. But I also think there's a satisfaction in discovering a playstyle. Even if you end up at the same destination, at least you feel like you got there on your own. I think the best way to describe it is gamey. They sacrifice everything for the gameplay. It's understandable, but I think it can detract from the experience of the game. I mean, there's a reason most games put some effort into combining world building and story into level design and gameplay. Uh, something about immersion. Basically, it's a whole avenue to get players invested in your game. When they get a feeling of genuinely existing within the world, when the game sells you on the setting. For example, finding secrets in Doom Eternal feels very much like a guided process. In other games, you might get up to a new area you never thought you were supposed to reach and then be surprised to get rewarded for your exploration. In Doom Eternal, there's an icon in your map screen telling you where the quote unquote hidden thing is and then a big crack in the wall with a strict path to follow. The enemies just warp in out of nowhere, where other games might have a dropship or something. Occasionally, they'll just spawn behind you, which always sucks. This isn't some epic skill moment. Having enemies spawn behind you is bullshit design. There's also the fact that every pickup is some bright technicolor vomit. The blood and gore is nothing compared to the rainbow that pops out. Like the imps just randomly turn into an arms manufacturer Twitter account on Pride Month. I mean, I know why they did this. Something about customizing a Ferrari and making sure road signs are colorful. But I just feel like they could have done better in the whole world building and using level design for world building department without sacrificing the gameplay. Like, for example, the ammo being actual pieces of ammo that fall on the floor, and the big icon that you see being just some part of Doomguy's helmet or HUD. Kinda like Dead Space 2. It'd still be visible, but it would just be a little touch that immerses you in the world just a little bit. They could try to give some actual reason for enemies entering the map, like maybe a portal opening or something. They could try to cut down on invisible walls, let people go into unintended areas, trust players more and make secrets a part of the environment. They could also have done more encounter design besides arena maps where you kill all enemies to open the next room. You could have enemy encounters naturally blocking your path as you traverse through the level. At least more of that than there currently is and encounters that are actually more substantial. This also ties into the issue with the platforming. I think the reason a lot of people felt like it broke the flow of the game is that it wasn't challenging and it felt completely separate to what you were doing for the rest of the game. I'd say populating the level with more enemies that you encounter along the way would also be far more classic Doom. That's how it actually worked in those original games. All of the enemies spawned on the map and were there from the start of the mission. I'd say Classic Doom did a better job with exploration and world building in a mission, feeling 
feeling like you are actually exploring a place. Of course, I'm not saying abandon the arena encounter design, but it could have benefited from more diversity in terms of encounters. Of course, the natural response to this would be story, and by extension world building, in Doom matters about as much as story in a porn movie. This stuff isn't important. You can enjoy the game without it. That's true. But first of all, I don't think there's a reason not to put in small touches for the sake of world building. I think it'd improve the experience and you could add extra world building and immersion details without detracting from the gameplay. There's also the fact that they actually did put effort into the story this time around. I mean, they have this whole section on Sentinel Prime where you literally just go through, listen to exposition and pick up notes. I think they could have put more focus on making this lore actually matter to you in game and present it in a less jarring and more coherent manner that fits in with the rest of the game. Like, oh, Doom Guy has a friend. Too bad you only ever meet him once. So that does bring me to the next point, the story. It sucks. I think it's really bad. Again, they don't have the excuse of previous Doom games where, you know, it's not story focused. They have all these cutscenes and these lore tabs. They could have had this simplistic self-aware story if it was like Doom 2016, but they committed. It's an incoherent mess where they clearly pull whatever they want out of their ass as they go along. The Slayer is actually Doom Guy, who's an ancient knight, but also actually born in the modern day. And also Samuel Hyde is a robot who's actually an angel, who's actually an ancient alien, and they betrayed you, although he still helps you. And this AI is actually God, and Satan is you, but he actually made you, and he's actually God, and hell is actually a sci-fi realm, and heaven is actually this place called Erdak, and look, it would have been fine if they didn't try to make me engage with this stuff at all. I tried to give the story a good shot, but there are no characters to get attached to. There are no character arcs. There's no development, just a random stream of plot points. There is one central theme, that being how completely friggin' awesome you are. It almost feels a bit insulting that they put this stuff in the game, expecting that people will care about it. And people did care about the story, but I think that's only because they enjoy the game. I don't think this is a story people would like on its own. I think people are likely to overlook flaws like this in something they love. What I hate most about this story is that they made it into the most generic sci-fi schlock. Hell's become just some parallel dimension. When I think of fighting hell, I think of THE hell. Hell hell. The one in the Bible. The divine comedy. I want to fight demons from hell. Not just aliens that we call demons. And aliens that look like angels. I like it when games are grounded by some kind of cultural relevance and significance, similarly to Wolfenstein. I don't want to be fighting made up characters who don't even wear swastikas. I want to fight Hitler, Mecha Hitler. If I made Wolfenstein, I'd have you fighting bizarro versions of all the Nazi high command, like Goering, but he's so fat he's like a mancubus. Likewise, in this game about Hal, I want to fight against actual Hal. How cool would it be if the bosses were demons like Baphomet or Beelzebub? And I'm disappointed there was never any Satan boss fight. Imagine how cool that would be. You see, that's why I thought Doom 2 had the Icon of Sin. Because it would have been too controversial or disrespectful to depict Satan in a game. They already had enough controversy back then to deal with. Nowadays, I don't see why they couldn't. I highly doubt anybody would be offended. If anything, it's more disrespectful to portray this bizarro version of heaven and angels that are actually selling out mankind to the demons. The game we have now isn't a far cry from what was originally shown at the E3 demos. But there are some important differences that cropped up over time. Remember when there was going to be an invasion mode? That was cool, but it got canned, obviously. Battle mode doesn't really have what it takes to grab my attention. Apparently, it has a small but dedicated community. The horde mode they added was very cool. I think it's just there for those who want more of the Doom Eternal combat. It is somewhat disappointing that it's not endless, though, because in a sense, it isn't even really a horde mode. 
When you think of a horde mode, you think of zombies, something that's never ending, trying to beat your previous high score. Apparently there was some huge controversy around the Ancient Gods Part 2. Its difficulty wasn't tuned very well. It was far too easy on launch until you get to the final boss, that's an absolute bitch. I can say, playing through the DLCs after the update, it felt like a more consistent difficulty curve from the base game to the Ancient Gods 1 to Part 2. Apparently they did work on that a fair bit in their updates. They did rebalance it over time. The DLCs were really there to just test you out at full capacity, at least until the Dark Lord fight. Despite the changes that still sucked hard, it's strange hearing that apparently it was even worse on launch. I shudder to think how that might have been. It's just a shitty, frustrating marauder, and it goes against everything you learnt throughout the game. You're meant to shoot the marauder whenever you get a free shot. There are ways to hit him when he doesn't have his shield, but no, this guy just heals whenever you shoot him. You literally just have to wait until his eyes glow, otherwise you're setting back your progress. To be entirely honest, I think each subsequent release was a step down. From the campaign, to DLC 1, to DLC 2, I think each offering was slightly lower quality than the last. And I think there are underlying reasons, fundamental to Doom Eternal's design in particular. And may I be so bold as to say, Doom isn't eternal? I want to look at the Marauder. He's the centerpiece of the game, the piece de resistance. I love him. I like how he is basically the anti-Doom guy. He has a bunch of tools in his belt to unload at any time. He really engages you and pushes you really hard. He is the boss that keeps you in check. The pop quiz to keep you on your toes. Have you been paying attention? Get too close, get shotgunned. Shoot his shield, he introduces you to his pit bull apples. Consumer of 500 toddlers. You've got to have good timing as well as managing your environment. He's actually a very fair and predictable boss. I got my ass absolutely kicked by him when I first went up against him. He gained a mythical reputation among the broader gaming audience when Doom Eternal first released. I remember when the game first launched and all the critics bitched about him to no end. The issue for them was typically that he was too hard and his speed messed with the pacing of the game. Here's the thing. The Marauder is actually too easy. Have you ever seen how quickly experienced Doom players can dispatch him? Those people can delete him in a second. I played through the first time on Ultra Violence and again on Nightmare. And honestly, the Nightmare run was easier, including the Marauders. Because here's the thing about Doom Eternal. There's very little RNG, very little uncertainty. There aren't many occasions when you're up against an enemy and you don't know what attack they're going to pull. Because the enemies are so fast, with so much health, deliberately designed to push you hard and overwhelm you. It'd simply be frustrating if they could just change attack randomly. Imagine if the Marauders could randomly spawn with a hammer or something, and the attacks they did against you were completely random and unpredictable. Now, there are some enemies with a degree of RNG, like the Prowler and the Carcass, and they're the two most bullshit enemies. They are among the weakest enemies as well, and they're not super fast either. Imagine if any of the stronger enemies had that degree of uncertainty. It'd be hell. Well, it is hell, but it'd be even hellier. Now, this isn't bad per se. In fact, in the context of this game, predictability is unequivocally a good thing. Reliability and consistency is a necessity for this kind of combat. But let's compare it to other games. Typically in FPS, there is slightly more room for RNG, unpredictability. There are base enemy types with an expected set of behavior, but they can be made to feel brand new by a subtle change like a new weapon or more health. For example, think of Craig from Halo. There is a baseline expectation of brute behavior. Regularly, it'll stay back and shoot at you. If you leave an opening, it'll flank you. If you take down its armor, it'll go berserk and charge you. But there's always a degree of unpredictability. You never quite know what they're going to do. 
because they're capable of a very large number of abilities. They have quite a large toolbox. They're dynamic enemies. They could throw a grenade, a bubble shield, or a shield drain. They could push for a melee, or they could hold back. They could do so many things, and were unpredictable, and part of the strategy for Halo was accounting for what the enemies could pull out next. This is why they could make this exact same enemy type feel fresh in so many different environments. Give him camo, it's an entirely different encounter. Give him a jump pack, and he's a completely different enemy. With a gravity hammer or furod cannon, he becomes a mini boss. Although he's fundamentally the exact same, the encounter changes completely when you give him a new weapon, equipment, armor, or even just a new environment. I will say this isn't unique to Halo. Most FPS games have enemies like this to some degree that completely change dependent on context. It's not like most FPS games don't have any predictability at all either. Halo's enemies are predictable to some extent. Basically to summarize the issue, other games go for a more general enemy design with a wide array of capabilities, while Doom Eternal goes for more niche design where every enemy has a small set of capabilities to fill a certain role. In these typical first person shooter games, much of the challenge and strategy in combat arises from adapting to the enemies. Figuring out, how do I beat this enemy? How do I account for his potential actions? In Doom Eternal, the enemies are far more predictable. Any individual enemy has very sound strategies to beat them very quickly. Even the toughest enemies, they're static. Each enemy fills a specific role. Again, this is absolutely a good thing in this context. I'd absolutely hate it if there were more unpredictable or dynamic enemies in Doom Eternal. So, in Doom Eternal, they still have to keep it fresh. They still need to keep you strategizing throughout the game. They mix it up using enemy composition. It becomes more of a case of how do I tackle this combination of enemies? The challenge in any arena in Doom Eternal is choosing who to take down first, while not being killed by the other enemies. I gotta take out the totem first, then the carcasses so they don't annoy me later, then the whiplash that's pushing me, then I get a blood punch so I can kill this armored mancubus. That's the kind of thought you do when you're playing Doom Eternal. This is why community mods made for people who've played a thousand hours who inject Doom Eternal directly into their eyeballs have such messed up, seemingly impossible enemy compositions like fight five buffed marauders, a cursed prowler, and 10 barons. They've just gotten so used to all the other potential enemy combinations. Having played it so many times, this is also why so many of the additional enemies in the DLC were basically centered around changing your enemy priority on the battlefield, like spirits, cursed prowlers, and screecher zombies. So how do you keep a game like this fresh for the average person through a playthrough? Naturally, you throw new enemies into the mix to change the dynamic and occupy a new niche. And Doom Eternal did exactly that. That's why Doom Eternal has such a massive enemy roster. They have enemies to occupy any role imaginable. Slow, fast, tanky, weak, aggressive, passive, support, low, high flying. They've crammed it in every orifice, filled every niche. The question then remains, where do you go from there? This is why I feel each DLC took a subsequent step down. It seems like they were having trouble trying to implement new enemy designs. I think the DLC enemies weren't as good and weren't as well utilized or integrated. They all just felt like riffs on existing ideas. Armored Baron? So kind of just like a Baron Marauder and he's barely utilized. Stone Imps and Spirits just felt like a way to get you to use underutilized weapon mods by making it so they're the only effective ways to beat them, rather than perhaps making more creative ways to get you to use those mods. Cursed Prowlers sucked. Riot Soldiers and Bloodmakers were rifts on existing enemies with some annoying invulnerability attached. This is why when I see people asking for another Doom game from id, I just have to wonder how? Where do they go from here? I felt that another entire game in the same vein as Doom Eternal would just feel like a repeat due to the aforementioned issues. I don't think they can surprise us with this formula anymore. If they had to revisit Doom, I think they'd have to reimagine it again, similarly to the jump from 2016 to Eternal. This is why I'm glad that id Software seems to be looking into newer territory, and I'm very excited to see where they go next. 
Don't get me wrong, I think Doom Eternal was a fantastic game. I just hope that id continues to try new things. So, where does Doom Eternal stand in the Doom Legacy? Well, like I established, I think it's quite a departure from classic Doom. But that's not a bad thing at all. So was Doom 3. I think we can consider Doom to be a kind of game that's linked fairly loosely by gameplay, but similar in that they represent some vanguard in innovation for first person shooters. One way that I feel modern day id fails to live up to the Doom legacy is actually their id tech engine. Classic Doom pushed shooters forward in part due to the source code being made publicly available. Carmack released it on an open source GNU G GPL license, basically meaning anybody could use it how they want just so long as it wasn't commercial use. This basically stopped as soon as Carmack left the company, with the last engine, I believe, being the Doom 3 BFG edition engine. I know it's very unrealistic to expect a AAA studio to just release their source code in the modern day. I'm aware that it's not industry standard and it's not going to ever happen again, but I do think it's symbolic of the change in attitude in the industry. I can only assume there's a general attitude among the engineers of, I worked on this, why should I give it away for free? It's disappointing, but that's just the way it is. Doom Eternal was a good game. And id has a bright future ahead. I think there's been an awful rot of homogeneity lately in gaming. And id Software is one of those companies that seems to be trying to break that. To fight against it. To go against the mold. I applaud them for it. And they have my gratitude for giving me an awesome game. For making the best game of 2020. Though the world has really felt like it's been in stasis since then. It still holds up two years later. Thank you for watching and goodbye.